briefly introduce. Federico, dimmi tu quando possiamo cominciare. Stiamo già registrando. Parto. Ok, ok. So I guess we can, we can, we can begin. Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, new uh, seminar of this series uh, organized by Cisco on some key categories and concepts uh, we historians have used and uh, used to make sense of modern and contemporary history and how the meaning and the use of those concepts and categories uh, uh, have evolved uh, over time. We are discussing the nation today, uh, somehow the resurgence of the nation. Uh, and we are doing it uh, with uh, two very special uh, uh, guests, uh, uh, Jeremy Edelman and Sonia Levson. I'll briefly introduce them uh, before giving the floor uh, to uh, uh, Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy is a Charles Lee Professor of History at uh, Princeton, where he also directs a remarkable uh, project, the Global History uh, Lab, which is a platform for learning, skill development, and collaboration in the creation of new narratives across uh, global divides, as I read from the, from the website, uh, the Global History uh, Lab uh, involves at this point uh, many other universities and NGOs and offers an online course, which I urge you to look at, a history of the world, uh, which educates uh, uh, students about the history of globalization and which has, which is possibly the most remarkable part uh, of the program, outreach uh, programs to refugees in Kenya, Jordan, Rwanda and Uganda, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy is a historian of development of Latin America. He has published many books among his most recent books, uh, Worlds Together, Worlds Apart, A History of Humankind from the Beginning to the Present, which is used in the Global History Lab, and uh, a wonderful uh, book slash biography of Albert Hirschman, worldly philosopher, The Odyssey of Albert Hirschman, which came out, I think, in 2013. I know he's writing a new book, uh, uh, Earth Hunger, Global Integration and the Need for Strangers, not of strangers, for strangers. Uh, I don't know uh, where uh, you are uh, in, the process, in the process of writing this book. You can tell us more uh, uh, today. Uh, as a uh, uh, discussant, uh, uh, Sonia Levson has kindly agreed uh, to be here with us and to comment on Jeremy's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, Sonia is a Dilthey Fellow at the Department of Modern and Contemporary History of the University of Freiburg. Uh, she has published uh, several two books and several articles on modern European history, including the most recent uh, uh, monograph a book on authority and democracy, a cultural history of education in uh, Germany and in West Germany and uh, France. And she has also, she has co-edited a forthcoming issue of uh, uh, the uh, European Review of History, La Revue Européenne d'Histoire, uh, with uh, Kiran Patel uh, on uh, transnationalism and beyond uh, transnationalism, which will appear next year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Sonia. So uh, without further ado, I'll give the floor uh, to you, uh, Jeremy, for, you know, for your uh, uh, presentation, 25 to 30 minutes. And then uh, Sonia will offer uh, a rejoinder, which will kickstart uh, the conversation, the discussion. Again, thanks so much for accepting our invitation and for being here with us today. Thank you so much, uh, Mario, for the uh, generous introduction, for the opportunity to, to share ideas uh, with you all uh, before we kind of opened up the room to, to the world. Uh, we were discussing this Zoom fatigue that we're all feeling after over a year of doing this. Uh, so what I'm gonna try to do, cause I realize, you know, the, we, things, uh, yeah, fatigue sets in after three minutes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually not gonna read anything even though I do have a text, which I sent to Sonia. I'm, I'm going to speak from notes and hopefully make some eye contact and hopefully not talk too loudly. I just learned that, uh, 
that there's data to show that we speak 15% more loudly when we talk to a screen than when we talk to a human being. So uh, I'll try not to bellow. Um, let me just jump right in um, and, and say that uh, I, I think about four years ago, I, I, I wrote a piece, Mario uh, alluded to this in an in a email correspondence that he and I have been having uh, for some time uh, in um, a journal called Aeon Magazine. It's an online platform. Um, it's a great journal, by the way, quite aside from whatever I write in it, but it does a lot of multimedia documentary stuff. It's committed to, to, to putting ideas out into the public sphere with no paywall. So they have a huge global leadership, uh, readership rather, uh, uh, because it's so accessible. Um, that piece uh, that I wrote, which was about, in a sense, the crisis, or what I think of as more the crossroads of global history, God interpreted as a condemnation of global history when it was really an invitation for us all to have a conversation about its future after 10 or so years of euphoria around what we considered to be global history and some unexamined attachments to the process of globalization. Now, four years later, uh, Donald Trump is out of office. That had been the provocation for me writing that, that we had a, a, a view that, that actually the old globalization or the global history narratives around integration were um, carried baggage that we had to examine. I'd say the crisis of our narratives is, if anything, deeper. Um, so what I want to talk about now is, is really about what I've called in a piece that will appear next week, but I'm just going to speak from notes, um, the revival of the patriotic narrative uh, that faced with the crisis of our global stories, um, there has been a resurgence of uh, patriotic storytelling, and I think this is a problem. And we who work in the field of transnational or even national history have to raise some questions about. Uh, let me start with two observations. Uh, one, about what's happened in the last decade uh, and the ways in which it's affected our historical imaginaries. Um, uh, one is the return of uh, the patriotic narrative. And I'm going to talk mainly about the Anglo-American world but it's very prominent in France. It's very prominent in India. It's extremely prominent in Latin America where I do a lot of my work. Uh, up. So a question I'll pose right out there among you all is how much you feel these currents in Italy and, 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 and in other places where you happen, happen to work. Let's put that as a question to start with. Um, and that is that the epic of the nation state is the dominant form of framing social interdependency and the making of political community and, I, and, and a sense of belonging. Uh, and that the nation is restored its central place in uh, the imaginary of togetherness. Um, moreover, that the nation and uh, national rhetoric emerged as the language of resistance against market-driven um, uh, 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 global integration. Faced with this, this is my second observation, that progressives, I include myself in that, what I hope is a very open camp, um, on the left, have turned their backs on internationalism, especially in the Anglo-American world, but not only in the Anglo-American world. This is true, as I said, in, in Latin America. Uh, and 10 years ago, uh, whereas the nation appeared to be tired, old, fatigued, a relic, and I think that was a strategic mistake. Now it is the global that appears tired, fatigued, old, and faced with that vacuum, the left and the right have pushed the nation back at the center of our scopes. So as I mentioned four years ago, I wrote this piece about the, the, the crossroads of, of, of global history. I would say that now, especially as the pandemic reminds us, um, that we have a crisis of our narratives. There are, there's a, 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 an intersection of a, of a short-term crisis of care um, that COVID provokes and a longer-term crisis around the climate and uh, uh, global migration. And we are having great difficulty figuring out what are the narrative um, 
um, uh, resources, repertoires we can turn to uh, to help make sense of this. Faced with this, by default, many historians, and this is what I want to critique, have returned to the sanctuary of the nation. What's more, that this progressive effort to reclaim the nation is a response to nativist surges that, of course, you're familiar with in Italy that we have endured in the United States, and it's not gone away in the United States in spite of the Trump defeat. Uh, and we could talk about the politics of all of this if, if you want in the Q&A. Um, that is that it feels like progressives in reclaiming the nation, it's a progressive counteroffensive against nativism to make the case for civic nationalism as opposed to ethno-nationalism, but it raises questions um, uh, 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 to my mind, um, uh, it, it is not a counteroffensive. In fact, it's an admission of defeat. Moreover, it is not the first defeat of progressive uh, storytelling. It's indeed the second one. For after 1989, the left pretty quickly abandoned its socialist heritage for thinking about interdependence and integration. And since 2008, it has been giving up its internationalist endowment. So we have a long overdue need for a reboot or a resetting of our uh, global uh, storytelling habits. Um, I'll start by taking, um, and, 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 and let's just say, I think one way to begin to reset this is to take seriously two features of the modern experience. One is the nature of interdependence in the modern world. And the second is that we need to reconfigure the nation as itself a global product, right? That the creation of the nation was always imagined from the 18th century when one might say horizontal comradeship began to push the nation as the bounded community in which, into which a sense of horizontal comradeship might get mapped on was always part of an international or as Jeremy Bentham called it an, inter, uh, an interstate or as Jeremy Bentham would call it an international system. So we need in a sense a double vision that works across multiple scales because all declarations of independence are simultaneously declarations of interdependence. That the nation requires recognition for its existence, uh, recognition on the part of co-members of this wider system that we would call the international. The problem is that the effects of 1989 unleashed contradictory forces. One was it released the last round of global decolonization so that the nation state would cover the planet with now 100 and depends on how you, know, you want to count some of these units, 193, 94 uh, co-members of the United Nations. Um, there are no more um, empires. Question, you could put a question mark uh, around that. Uh, while at the same time, economic and technical changes um, and forces deepened the interdependency across nations. So we had, uh, we've now been going through uh, almost three decades of um, the globalization of the nation, but uh, in deepening interdependence across them. This, of course, was driven by, um, you know, for shorthand, we can call it a, a process of spreading market fundamentalism, um, and which had a propensity, of course, to, uh, which, which, um, in a sense, privilege the forces of connectivity, exchange, flow, liqu liquefaction, and the creation of a hyper-capitalist sense of time. And in many ways, and this goes back to our own field as global historians, we embraced some of that rhetoric um, in thinking about our uh, global storytelling. Uh, and in fact, as many early global historians argued, um, 
that going global was a way of transcending and of writing a post-national history, as if there was a dichotomy between writing about the nation and writing about the globe or the international. Uh, and I can give you plenty of examples of friends of mine and colleagues of mine who were very euphoric about writing post-national history. That was a conceptual and a strategic mistake, something we can unpack. Sonia might bring us back to that to that question. While all of this, of course, was going on in Buenos Aires and in Cape Town and many other parts of the global south and lots of parts of the not so global south, we could include Greece and Italy, Spain, um, especially after 2008, we're much less euphoric about this. I mean, we have to recognize that not everybody was bending to this new language and rhetoric of liquidity and fluidity. And in fact, the nation was a resort for, um, for resisting uh, the inequalities that the market was uh, producing. Soon enough, though, uh, some of this impulse to put the nation back in as a force of resistance against market-based integration uh, led to uh, the resurgence of an ethnic-based uh, nationalism. Uh, you're all familiar with this. You have your own, um, um, that is that it, Italy has its own vernacular expression of this. The other vernacular expressions were of course, Brexit, Modi, we can go down the list. And a particular anxiety around migrations and, uh, and minorities, right? the transnationalization of the political community. And that has led to history wars everywhere. That is that the, the narrative became a battleground uh, for thinking about place and, uh, and community. Donald Trump established, um, and Mario will, will have some strong thoughts on this one, what he called the 1776 Commission. Um, as you know, in Turkey, Erdogan uh, proceeded to uh, engage in a cleansing operation of the entire higher education system in Turkey to push out unpatriotic uh, uh, scholars, including many historians. Um, and, and in the paper, I, I write a little bit about what's happening in Hong Kong and in, in China about the rewriting of history texts, um, the patriotic litmus test for public officials, uh, the control over schooling uh, in university history education. This is not a, um, uh, these are not uh, exotic, uh, faraway things. This is now, we're seeing this uh, uh, replaying in, in different vernaculars around the planet. I'll, just to remind you here in kind of my backyard, uh, the war over what to do with the monuments. Again, something we, we can talk about. And this has yielded to uh, uh, narratives around uh, what I call suicide, um, the suicide of the West, the suicide of the nation, particularly among right wing, but also increasingly among left wing historians, public intellectuals and philosophers. Swapan Das Gupta in India, Jonah Goldberg in the United States, Eric Zemmour, who uh, will be very familiar to many of you, um, and philosophers like Alain uh, Finkelkraut and others um, whose book, The Unhappy Identity, spotlights the need to restore the centrality of the, of the nation and national identity building in order to, um, to, to restore the bonds of solidarity around uh, the uh, nation state. Moreover, that the enemy is not just the, the foreigner, the outsider, but also the cosmopolitan within, the global historian, right? Uh, who betrayed the nation by denouncing the nation or declaring it as an obsolete agent in our uh, togetherness. Um, and I won't, we, again, this is something we can talk about that the global historians had unwittingly fallen into a trap into which they can then become seen as uh, the enemies uh, of the nation. And so the global became a stigma in the same way that the global historians had once stigmatized and cosmopolitans had once been presented as having stigmatized the nation. And, and here I'll, I'll kind of end, uh, the, the, the piece reflects on 
uh, the turn in the United States in particular. And I should say, I wrote this uh, just before the Biden inauguration. I was writing it right around the time. Uh, and I think Mario and I were exchanging emails about what was happening in Washington um, on the eve of, of the Biden inauguration and very concerned about um, the impasse in national uh, storytelling and very concerned that perhaps the most important historian on the public stage in the United States, Jill Lepore at Harvard University is an example of this term. And so the last part of the paper talks a lot about uh, about her work. In many ways, she's a remarkable historian and a storyteller, but it's time we unpack uh, her effort to reclaim the centrality of the national narrative, the patriotic narrative in our curriculum, in our uh, uh, research uh, agendas. For global historians, as she puts it, disavowed the nation. And that's an important verb for her, that, that when we write narratives about political communities, we are engaged in creating vowing systems around public memories and, and shared identities. And so in order to restore the centrality of the American narrative, she reaches back to, and I don't wanna to get too much into a tribal discussion, tribal among his American historians. Um, and I should say, you know, I'm, I'm Canadian origin though I've been living here uh, for many years. And so I kind of live inside and outside the ecumene uh, which is to reclaim a word that's very close and very debated um, among American intellectuals and historians, which is exceptionalism, right? That America was a country born liberal and that as far as Jill Lepore and other progressive historians, because she, she is a progressive historian, but there are others, David Blight at Yale and elsewhere would say that what is key to American exceptionalism is that this was a nation that was born liberal, right? We can unpack this. It turns out it's an it has a much older genealogy going back to modernization theory in the 1940s and 1950s and the Cold War American imaginary. Some would say it goes back to the 19th century. We can discuss this for those of you who are interested in American historiography. But it becomes very clear by the 1950s, right? That the, that, that the exceptionalist feature of America was that it was liberal and that it was endowed therefore with a particular mission, which was to spread liberalism globally. Um, but what's important for Jill Lepore is that this is the way to reclaim the nation, to take it back from the nativists um, that uh, uh, who had presented an America that was in danger, that was imperiled um, because, and in fact, they argued like all other nations, and this was very important for Donald Trump's discourse that America was imperiled like all other nation states. There was nothing particularly unique about the United States and Trump's imaginary that all nations had been undermined by cosmopolitans from within and strangers from without. <clears throat> and it was time to restore <clears throat> uh, the nation and, uh, and the power of the nation and the equipoise between co-managing uh, nation states, which is why uh, what helps explain Trump's and, and his entourage's affection for uh, rethinking uh, bilateralism, or again, something we can, we can unpack. So faced with this, Jill Lepore wants to reclaim the nation, this time as, a, as uniquely liberal, endowed with exceptionalist features. Furthermore, that the true American patriot has to be a liberal one in order to be American. And that the liberal narrative of peoplehood is national. This is a double move that she engages and we could talk about many books and articles, pieces in Foreign Affairs Magazine, Bloomberg News. She really is a very, very prominent uh, figure on the landscape. The consequence for her is that liberalism can only be safeguarded by the nation. The nation to be born liberal implies, however, some blind spots. And here I'll, I'll, I'll end by signaling two of them that should be of concern for those of us who are thinking about transnational, transregional 
global or multi-scalar forms of history. Uh, the first is, of course, um, that the born liberal uh, uh, storyline, uh, one might say the myth, um, has to make some certain claims about what is called settler uh, colonialism. Right to leave other people out of the story about the liberal origins of the nation, right, including and especially the indigenous people who were there uh, and uh, who got uh, exterminated as a result of the creation of the American nation. That others are left out of the story until the immigrant, in quotation mark, arrives on the shores of the United States to seek escape from illiberal countries elsewhere. So it's very important that the other is either erased from the narrative or framed inside the narrative of the nation in order to be seen to be joining this inclusive um, uh, um, uh, multi-denominational and multi-ethnic nation state, right? Um, and uh, because it is liberal. It's worth saying that this is not the only way, um, there are other ways in which the national narrative uh, can be framed in a way that does not present strangers and others as either those who are excluded from the story or admitted into the story because they are claiming a liberal membership in New Zealand, Australia, Canada. There are ways of uh, talking about um, uh, about national past that admit uh, to the role that ethnocide played in the creation of the myth of the nation itself. And we can talk a little bit more if you want about the, what are called land acknowledgements uh, that are important rituals that precede any public activity in, in Australia and in Canada, including at hockey games, uh, as a way of uh, recognizing and acknowledging the exclusionary origins of the nation state. Um, so it's not necessary to erase in order to create a liberal narrative, I'll put that out. But Jill Lepore does, and I think it's a problem with the way progressives in the United States have strategically reclaimed the nation in this way. Secondly, and the part that concerns me uh, as much is the non-recognition that what prevents the nation from doing horrible things to other people, like strangers and others, are the restraints that are posed not by the internal uh, checks and balances of the liberal uh, self-imagined nation, but the rules and norms into which it is embedded when it emerges as a nation on the wider global stage. That is, that we can't tell the story of the national or the formation of nation states without um, uh, integrating it within the wider international circulation and remaking of the rules and norms that restrain the nation uh, from uh, committing abuses in its own name. That the idea of the American nation cannot be severed from the international of which the United States has always been an important part. I'm just gonna end, unfortunately, reading the last page of the piece. Um, Sonia has it, so she knows what I'm, I'm, I'm going to say. Um, but I thought rather than just ending on a series of dot, dot, dots, I would, I would give you the finale here. Um, and that is uh, that those who uh, make the case for reviving, like Jill Lepore, for reviving the patriotic narratives are not just reclaiming the nation from the bullies who lock up students, who dismember journalists and exile their intellectuals. We all know who those are. They are also admitting defeat. They are in effect declaring an end to the search for narratives that reconcile membership in nations which was the internationalist credo uh, of uh, progressive uh, storytelling, storytellers with questions of belonging to a wider order. In the summer of 1950, Hannah Arendt made an appeal for new narratives. Herself still a refugee, it, she was a stateless person. Uh, she had come as a refugee and had not yet when she would published the origins of totalitarianism he had just barely acquired and that was in 1952 just barely acquired american citizenship 
Uh, she told her readers um, that, quote, only in a new political principle, in a new law on earth, whose validity this time must comprehend the whole of humanity, which I think is a key word for us to think about what uh, would be a, uh, the vocabulary, in a sense, for a new global storytelling. Only with this new principle, she argued, will nations be restrained from their worst habits. Yes, this had to reckon with the realities of territorial nation states. She did not ever argue that the nation state was obsolete or irrelevant, unlike some of our colleagues in global history. Um, but this new principle, she argued, should not license taking that which is good in the past and simply call it our heritage, unquote. The horrors of her age and the sight of drowning refugees or the sound of orphaned children on the borders of the United States in our age are no less real than they were when the time when Hannah Arendt was writing. And this is why I'm just using this thing to distinguish her voice from mine. And this is why all efforts to escape from the grimness of the present into nostalgia for a still intact past or into the anticipated oblivion of a better future are vain, unquote. So for humanity's sake, Arendt urged readers to see the nation as a necessity capable of such cruelty that it could never be entrusted on its own to do good. In the aftermath of the Holocaust and a century of imperial violence, the temptation to retreat to the comforts of nostalgia, which is what she was signaling was a problem, to make any nation great again, right, by returning to its heritage, which is what Jill Lepore wants, ducked the challenge of creating narratives that transcend the false choice of belonging <clears throat> either to the nation or to a world that makes nations possible. Patriotic revivalists, if they want to improve their case, and a lot of these take the form of litigious histories, need to square up to a paradox that the world needs nations to do good things, like reduce carbon emissions and stop treating stateless people as less than human. But to do good things, nations have to be good. But the condition for the existence of good nations is other good nations doing good things for each other. And for those who have had their homes taken away because their nations have not been good. So my question is, why not start there with that premise for new stories of nations for a new global age? And with that, I'll end. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Jeremy. Uh, before turning it to, uh, to Sonia, I forgot uh, to say at the beginning that if we, those who want to intervene, pose questions or comment, please, you can uh, uh, write to me using the, the chat function or discussion uh, uh, function of Zoom and I'll make uh, a list of uh, intervenants. Sonia, uh, uh, your turn to comment on these and to open the discussion. Well, yeah, many thanks for, for the invitation to take part in this fascinating debate. Many thanks to Jeremy for this intriguing talk. And it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And this in particular, because I think, or in my opinion, it is indeed, there is hardly indeed a more pressing task for historians than to discuss the nation, both as a concept in historiography and its relevance um, in our recent past and our present. So what I will do is try to add a few thoughts to Jeremy's talk from the specific perspective of an historian of European history. And Jeremy has spoken of the return of the nation that for some time rather got lost from sight, tended to be sidelined by public discourse and also by some scholars of um, global history, a discipline that in some variants tended to reproduce the excitement of globalization instead of criticizing or analyzing it. The diagnosed return of the nation thus seems into public and into historical discourse, thus appears to some extent as a reaction to a blind spot of publics and historians, the failure to recognize the resilience of the nation in our present. And if one looks beyond historiography, 
historiography, I think that the resilience both of the nation as imagined community and of nation states as actors seems to me sort of a consensus. So most sociologists of globalization never joined the flat earth covers, but since the 1990s pointed consistently towards the integrated processes of growing interdependence and um, a continuous or even strengthened significance of nation states, um, the in those two as interrelated processes. Seeing globalization and the rise of particularism as closely connected has become common sense and populism is um, usually understood as an answer to the need for the orientation that arises also from globalization processes. So taking this as a starting point, um, I would in the following like to add a few ideas on what our role as historians might be in this situation. Asking about historiography's specific tasks in grappling with the return of the nation or with the resilience of the nation, which term we might prefer, we might discuss. In this way, I think I'd rather build upon Jeremy's argument than to criticize it. So I would argue first that the core task of historians is to go beyond such large scale explanat explanatory patterns as the interrelation of globalization and populism. The sociological diagnosis that globalization and a return of particularism go hand in hand is of course correct, but in its swiftness at the same time, not very thought provoking or helpful. We as historians of the contemporary area should, I think, make it our task to ask precise questions about the fundamental transformations of the spatial context of politics since the mid 20th century. About the different levels of such transformation processes, about the actors involved, their variants and their consequences. So yes, we do see a revival or a wave of populism, but maybe more interesting than that are the many unanswered questions. So why is this revival such much more strong in some places than in the others? Which actors fueled it? Which structures or conditions limited it? And to which, to which extent does it build upon a largely uninterrupted tradition of nationalism, racism, and exclusion? And I will come back to that. So I think that historians of the period since 1945, and this is now speaking for European history, that they have not yet really taken up this challenge, this challenge to systematically inquire about and discuss the place of the nation, both in recent history and its role in historiography. I think this is to some extent strange, as within the field of modern European history, models for such an endeavor are not that difficult to find. In the last decade, historians of 19th century Europe have intensely and very fruitfully debated both about the concepts, about terms such as nation and nation state, as well as about the respective significance of and formative power of nation states, empires, and the hybrid mixtures in the era preceding the First World War. British New Imperial history contributed to this fruitful debate. Scholars such as Peter Judson working in Habsburg, Jörn Leonard and Ulrike von Hirschhausen discussing nation states and empires, and many scholars of nationalism in the 19th century who traced its relationship to the region and to the local, and many historians deconstructing national narratives by way of comparison. A range of fine and empirically dense and thought-provoking studies reassessed for this period, I would ask, say, the interrelation of processes of nationalization on the one hand and the first age of globalization on the other. And they reflected not on just them being connected or interrelated, but on the concrete contours, the concrete varieties and implications of such connections. And in my view, compared to this, and speaking for European historiography, the state of research on our most recent past looks unfortunately much less sophisticated. The terms nation and nation state are still very much used interchangeably by historians of the later 20th century. A fact which also might be an interesting point for the discussion maybe later on. The question of what a nation state might be as opposed to a state per se is rarely even raised. So without doubt, the very concept of the nation has changed considerably during the last two centuries. And again, and here I speak particularly for French and German historiographies, which I know best, but I think this holds also true for other European historiographies to a certain degree. 
While we have multiple volumes on the imaginings of the nation in the 19th century, thinking the nation in later 20th century Europe is a seriously under-researched topic. Particularly regarding Western Europe, research on nationalism still tends to focus unquestioningly on the period between the French Revolution and the Second World War, reflecting an underlying consensus that the nation lost its appeal after 1945. And I guess we probably all recognize today that that consensus was misleading, but we still need to kick off a whole historiographical debate and carry out a bulk of empirical studies, and this is my second point. Re thorough research on the imaginings of the nation, of national communities, and internationalism and its transformations after 1945 would significantly qualify our idea of a new wave of nationalism in our present. Frances Marine Le Pen, of course, is not only the daughter of Jean Le Pen, who founded the National Front in the 1970s and who won a seat in the European Parliament in the 1980s and has been consistently re-elected since then until he left the Parliament last year ago. But still, books on French nationalism tend to focus on the 19th century rather than the 20th, not confronting this tradition of French nationalism in the later 20th century. The wave of right-wing and anti-Semitic violence in last year's Germany is as disturbing as it is not new. It must be said in a longer degree of right-wing violence and of radical nationalism in post-war Germany, a tradition of which German historians long did not take note of, a blind spot of which they just begin to be aware of. So I, I would say that historiography has, historiography has to seriously research the strength and violence of nationalism in our most recent past in order to help us understand what happens in our present. And third, um, the latter 20th century has seen fundamental transformations of the spatial contours of politics, as Jeremy has said. But within European history, there has been no discussion on the characteristics and consequences of the spatial change, at least no discussion which is as fine-grained as discussions on the 19th century. All too often, historians of the recent past still speak of processes of transnationalization, and in such works, transnationalization is understood as a mostly positively connoted um, growing interconnectedness and increase in cross-border contacts and networking often implying a loss of relevance of nation states. There has, in the last years, um, been a wave of criticism regarding the normative implications of this project, so I'm not the first to say that. And at the moment, quite a few projects emerge to reassess these transformations. But these are only first steps, and we still have a long way to go. And this way remains long, because at the same time, I think that a disturbingly large part of contemporary history continues to define its spaces of investigation within national borders. And thus it cannot start to understand either the nation of the imagined community nor analyze the, its relationship to subnational or transnational spaces. The hegemony of national history has never really been broken in the period after 1945 and collected volumes about European history all too often consist of chapters which each treat a national case with comparative perspective and to a few footnotes in the interaction. And thus, without really challenging established interpretations or crossing historiographical divides. In addition, we can observe the emergence of parallel worlds of bubbles that do intersect far too little. British universities, for example, host excellent transnational and comparative research both on the European continent and in other world regions. But these fields have very, very little impact and are in very, very little dialogue with British history on the other side. And thus, they have also very little, little impact on British public discourse and on the discourse of Britain being an island detached from the European continent. So I guess what we need to assess the impact, the formative power, the relevance and significance of nations as compared to transnational imagined communities and transnational processes, but also as compared to the local and the regional, are first more comparative and transnational empirical studies, and second, a more intense dialogue between historiographies, between national academic communities. This has been sort of a consensus in our ongoing project, 
on debating um, the present state and the future of European history, in which historians from all over Europe discuss the future of European history as a field of research. And Giovanni Osina has been proud of that. But to make this an everyday reality in Europe, we would need a new way of funding research as agencies such as the CNRS in France, the Arts and Humanities Research Council in Britain or the German DFG tend to reproduce national borders rather than helping to transcend them. So fourth and finally, I would like to argue that historians need to go more thoroughly transnational and this implies in my view comparative history Precisely not because the nation lost its relevance, but on the contrary, in order to assess its relevance, to discuss its resilience, and to ask for its transformations. And I think this correlates very much with Jeremy's claim that we should not desert global history just when we need it most. We need, of course, a global history that refrains from celebrating interconnections that does not conflate questions with answers but asks for consequences and implications. Historians of Europe in the early decades have often made the, the mistake of confusing historians' task of asking questions with a tendency to provide narratives for a given name. Global history, of course, needs to avoid the same pitfall. And it needs to bring the nation more firmly back into the equation, but not in the way some global histories do it today. And this, again, refers to Europe. Because when in France in 2017, a thick volume called a Histoire Mondiale de la France, a global history of France, was published, this raised some criticism, mainly Brion from France, as almost all of its authors were French and had been working in French academia for most of their lives. Thus, rather unsurprisingly, the sort of global history looked very French to many commentators. It rather placed France at the center of the universe and decentering it. Alas, and instead of learning from the criticism in 2019, the global history of Germany was published a thorough German in authorship as the French was French, presenting something between a world made in Germany and an essentialized German nation in the middle of the world, with the world being reduced to a global context. In the last years, global histories of many other European countries have appeared, and I haven't studied all of these. But writing multiple global histories without engaging in a thorough historiographical dialogue does not help to question, to discuss, and to assess the significance of the nation as opposed to other transnational or subnational communities, actors, and spaces. It does not challenge established narratives. The motives of the French Histoire Mondiale had not least been political, countering nationalist discourses in public, but I would doubt if that was successful. So we're probably, to finish, in need, as Jeremy has said, of new stories of nations in a global age. My very unromantic conclusion would be that a prerequisite for telling such new stories is an enormous lot of empirical work that still needs to be done in order to understand our recent past and the place and meaning of the nation in it. Understanding the spatial change of the period since the 1970s, assessing the resilience and transformations of the nation, analyzing nationalism between continuity and change, engaging in a dialogue with the social sciences, taking in perspectives from East and West, North and South, all this will require much more research than historical departments that rarely grow, but rather shrink, can possibly in the next years deliver. But I think so there is a challenge and we should at least try to face it. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thanks uh, with this slightly, slightly optimistic <laughs> final note. <laughs> we should at least uh, uh, face it. Uh, uh, Jeremy, do you want to, 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 to respond uh, uh, as up or, or to Sonia's uh, comments before we open the discussion? Uh, I mean, fast, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussions and actually kind of all the reactions to Sonia because hers is in a sense more provocative for this group. Uh, yeah, I have, I have two just quick thoughts. Um, uh, one is about the the periodization that 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 you present, Sonia, about the 19th century is still where the 
um, the histories of nationalism, one might say, are on safe grounds, right? Um, it's emergent, it's uh, post-colonial, it's uh, post-monarchical, or sometimes, well, we can get into what it, but, but it can still have that euphoric feel to it, whereas the 20th century presents more troubles. I think the, the interesting takeaway that I take from, from, from your intervention is there's, that there's a, the, the biggest single gap may well be in the period from say the 1960s to the present and thinking about the nation and the unintended ways, maybe not so unintended, but the unintended ways in which Europeanization uh, um, clouded um, the, the uh, ways in which the nation, as you put it, in the sense of challenge to me, um, was resilient rather than um, recovered, right? That it remained an underlying default setting for the historical imaginary and Europeanization somehow mystified. I think that's an interesting way to think about paradoxically in the age of integration, right? So that's something to, to, to think about um, that I find very intriguing. Um, there's also the, the point you make about the versions of global histories. And I don't think it's only the French or the, um, or the German habits of writing the world histories of, of France, you know, to, to kind of, which reinforces the hexagonal feature and the voices who participate from it. But the, the, I would say from the place where I spent many years as a graduate student and then my first job was in the UK, the new British imperial history in many ways masqueraded as national history as well. Um, so it, it's, we need now to go back historiographically and look at those enterprises for the way they try to sound like global histories of the nation for the global age or the age of globalization um, how much did they really break away from, let's say, the romantic stories of the 19th century? I, I think that's an interesting way of, of, of framing the dilemma of, of um, the historiography of the last, say, 15 years or so. Sure. Thanks, uh, uh, Jeremy. Uh, for the moment, I have no request of uh, uh, interventions from, uh, uh, from the chat. So I'll, I'll pose myself a couple of questions uh, uh, to you, Jeremy. Um, the first one, you, you, you opened your talk with uh, David Armitage's kind of you know, citation, uh, uh, each declaration of independence is a declaration of interdependence. So the paradox here is that in order to become independent, you have to accept to become dependent, uh, right? Uh, is that kind of, you know, of, of a way of framing at this bridge between the nation and the global, you were you know, urging historians now to, to, uh, uh, to, to adopt, uh, uh, to avoid the temptation to retreat into a patriotic uh, narrative at uh, La, uh, La Lepor. Uh, and my second question, I mean, you, you spent a fair amount of time on, on Gilles Lepore, I mean, and she's certainly a, a very influential voice uh, uh, also in, in the new, I mean, she writes for the New Yorker. Uh, I mean, she's often on uh, NPR and you know, other programs. I mean, but she's also very, I mean, as a historian, as a public historian, hers is a very American story. So uh, a very exceptional story, if you think about it. Uh, uh, so how representative uh, Gilles Lepore can be, or how can we take Gilles Lepore outside of, a, of the American frame within which she operates? So those are my two questions. The second one is a bit of a rhetorical question, if you will. <laughs> it has an implicit uh, answer, and I urge my colleagues and friends to, to jump in the discussion. Thanks, Mario. Yes, I would say so. A couple of thoughts, and some of them go back to, in fact, to what Sonia said. Um, and this, um, I mean, she would call it resilience, uh, but the cunning ways in which the nation reasserts itself or nationalists 
reassert themselves even as the processes of interdependence uh, deepen. And one might say, uh, and this is also to engage contact with Sonia's point about engaging with the social science, there are many economists who now argue that, in fact, Danny Roderick has made this case that globalization doesn't make the nation less relevant, it just resignifies it, right? Because um, the risks and precarities that come with global integration throw people back onto the only institutions that they have to find shelter from those risks and hazards, which is the nation state, right? So, um, and that's where populism gets its taproot from, right? Um, and it's not uncoincidental that it rises after 2009 when the financialization of the world economy threw everybody to the mercy of, of creditors. Um, so the, the, the point that I pick up on David Armitage, who plays a funny role uh, in all of this because he's both part of the new imperial history turn uh, and writing British history in, in a, Sonia would say, not so new vein, perhaps. Uh, well, at the same time, I think there is in his book on the declarations of Inde uh, independence, uh, a claim that he makes that actually I think has more to it than perhaps he realized. And I, and I, in conversations with him, I've kind of pushed him on this, which is around the politics of recognition, right? And, and um, uh, that the Declaration of Independence is a request, it's a letter uh, to the wider international uh, for recognition of the existence of this new unit on earth. Um, called the United States of, or wanting to call itself the United States of America, and that there is no independence without recognition. We can talk about the road here to a dialectical model of thinking about this, and perhaps even in Hegel, that the struggle over recognition is what def it was what makes selfhood. That, in other words. What does he say in the phenomenology? To be human is to be recognized. And, and in some senses, this is what the declarants of independence uh, were, were insisting upon. And there's a flip side to this, which is the recognition, not just the, the request for recognition, but the, but the recognition of, um, uh, of the nature of global, what they didn't use the term, that doesn't really start to get some traction until later on in the 19th century, but the interdependence between nations. Uh, this was clearly something that um, in the Scottish Enlightenment uh, was essential to their imaginary. We, we can go down that rabbit hole if, 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 if we want, but for Hume and for Smith uh, and for many others trying to think about new models of interdependence, they would call the, the making of commercial society. That was the language of the 18th century, about which there was a lot of anxiety, of course, and Pocock and others have, have, have written about this. Um, but that the nation was a way to reimagine the nature of global interdependence that would put an end to the predatory, avaricious world of empires, right? That the new nations would create a um, create capacities to domesticate and to tame both the abuses of markets and the predatory inclinations of rulers. So there was something in the search for a new model of interdependence, thinking of the nation as the unit that would be best able to manage uh, this. Uh, and I think that that idea go, you know, uh, is as old as the nation itself. I and mean, it's just, just really just echoing what, what, you know, what Sonia was saying about the need to rewrite the history of the nation as, as part of a global, as a, uh, as part of a wider set of thinking about global stories. That's one. On, on Jill Lepore, yeah, can we deprovincialize uh, uh, Jill Lepore? Uh, I mean, I pick on her just because as, as Mario said, and for all of you, I mean, you really need to know how important she is uh, uh, on the American literary landscape. Um, if, if there were a historian laureate in the United States, um, uh, she would be it right now. Um, and she's been very prominent in particularly urging historians, uh, American historians, 
um, uh, to step up and answer uh, the Trump and the nativist and uh, the ethnocentric storytelling at a moment of very heightened, I mean, it's not just about Trump in the world, but, and, 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 and Sonia had mentioned this, a lot of it has to do with the way Americans think about race. We might spend some time on that. I think, and I am gonna say, Sonia has a way to think about this, which is to be more comparative and more granular about the different ways in which historians in different contexts respond to the global challenge, right? Um, that Jill Laporte is just one exemplar of this, uh, of this tendency. She just happens to be an extremely important one, so it's just easy to, 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 uh, to pick off. And because she's very explicit about her endowments to um, the exceptionalist storyline about the American nation. Um, but she's not the only one. I would say we really saw this intensify during the, the political campaign of last year between Biden, not just between Biden and Trump, uh, but over a Black Lives Matter and what happened in the wake of George Floyd and the bringing down of the monuments, the debate of last summer and the search for, as David Light put it, who's another extremely eminent historian in the United States, we need healing narratives. And I worry a lot about uh, the heal healing of what and for whom, all right? Um, and Blight and Lepore, and there is an informal circle of historians trying to, uh, to um, and I would say probably not just the United States, I think we're gonna see this elsewhere, um, trying to reassert the importance of the nation as the means through which it heals itself. So I don't think Jill Lepore is as singular, she's exceptional in some ways because of her stature, but she's not so singular in the sense that it's part of a wider push. And just last little thing, I think Sonia is absolutely right. I think uh, I just look at my own department and uh, not to air dirty laundry, but American history is back. Global history is out, area studies are out, European history. <laughs> And this is not just an American story. I think there is a rearrangement of the landscape. I'm sorry to hear that 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 uh, that Sonia did not think of the ERC, for instance. And when we think about funding and the way the incentive mechanisms work that restore and persist, uh, as as Sonia would put it, methodological nationalism. Um, uh, I think it's it's it. This is very very strong, at least in the United States. Sorry to hear that this is so strong in 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 Europe as well. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, there is a follow up on this, but before that, uh, let me turn it to to Federico Romero, who has a comment question. Federico, two two issues. Uh, I mean, the first thing I'm very happy to to hear the comeback of the term, if not the concept of interdependence, that was sort of obliterated by our discussion for a couple of decades, um, and it, that makes a lot of sense because it's it's extremely useful. Even though I understand fairly well that it has sort of different meaning in an American context, which is where where is the 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 opposite of exceptionalism, of course, to begin with. Um, and the notions that America leaves without interdependence, um, and a different one in a European context or elsewhere. But nonetheless, uh, it's, it's remarkable, uh, this, this comeback in many ways. Um, second point, uh, I would like to push both of you, Jeremy, but perhaps also Sonia, on this issue of how globalization or processes of globalizations and, and, and transnational approaches resignify, reconfigure the nation and also how we look at the nation, if we shouldn't take more um, openly in account the issue of the differences between nations at this point, in the sense that, uh, okay, let's use interdependence as a you know, measurement. Um, it seems to me that when we're talking about bigger and smaller nation, richer and poorer nations nowadays, we're talking about a deeply different order of magnitude than in the past. That the way in which nations 
particularly nation states, but not only the states, the nation itself can deal with the various phenomena that we associate with globalization changes, not simply quantitatively, but qualitatively between the bigger states, the more powerful entities, uh, those with uh, also uh, in many ways a stronger sense and stronger foundations for a nationalist identity and those in the middle of the scale and the poorer ones in which the term interdependence actually means dependence, period. Um, and then there are interdependent nations, there are more independent nations, and then there are a lot of nations that are deeply dependent. So I'm just wondering whether this issue of size, wealth, uh, endowments, means has to come into play in the way in which we think the nation and the place of a nation in the transnational and the global, because it seems to me that here, uh, what we see today, it's hardly comparable to, to, to the 19th century, for instance, or even for, to the first half of the 20th century. And I was wondering whether there's any ongoing reflections on this issue or not. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Federico Jeremy. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief because I'd love to hear uh, Sonia's views on this. Um, first on, on interdependence, um, uh, I would say that, so I use this word, it's, uh, so Mario mentioned that, I, you know, I'm writing this book, it feels like it's, I, 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 you know, four years ago, I had a draft of this book written and I've had to pulp it completely as I rethink um, th the narrative uh, and, and in a way, interdependence. And so, if Mario can gesture, oh, it's uh, sort of what, what's it called? Global integration, the need for strangers, right? Not the needs of strangers. In the old cosmopolitan narrative, that was the assumption, right? That what defined the cosmopolitan ethos was a curiosity and care for others, for strangers. And I've, as Mario pointed out, I've actually changed the word needs of strangers to needs for strangers, precisely to telescope the ways in which um, this, the, the, our, our contested ideas about what it means to depend on strangers and strangers to depend on us, and that's why it's inter, um, has been a through line of the modern condition that we've not really thought hard enough about. And I think Sonia has made this point as well. The one advantage, and I think you, that I agree with you completely, Federico, that, that, that using the language of interdependence allows us to talk about power and unevenness much more explicitly than the rather bland vocabulary of integration does. So interdependence as a way, as a way to reframe that asym asymmetry has always been part of the landscape. We can talk about what that means. Um, and that's why, as you said, you know, for some and here, uh, you know, my my roots back to Latin American historiography and the role of dependency theory has been key to how I get to replacing integration with interdependence. Um, because Latin American historians since the 19th century were never able to talk about the nation without reckoning with asymmetry and uh, dependency. Um, and I think that that's key. And it's a, a kind of the point that you were making on the second one. What's interesting that happened uh, um, increasingly over the course of the 1980s, but certainly um, in the wake of 2009, was the way in which the language of dependency and peripherality um, uh, fueled the idea that the nation was the way to resist the effects of market-based uh, uh, convergence. Uh, as, as one of the Gilets jaunes slogans put it, nous sommes tous de la périphérie maintenant, you know, in the sense that we have all become peripheral. Um, and this was key to Brexit talk and, and, and it was key to Donald Trump. We Americans had been sold out by the Clinton cabal to China, right? And made us dependent or peripheral. Uh, and it was reclaiming the nation 
uh, was a way of, of pushing back. And so in some senses, one might say that the language of dependency that had once been associated with Latin America and Africa and elsewhere had been recentered uh, to uh, Europe and then got exported from Europe to the United States. If we were to follow the track of the language, one could see that kind of thing going on. Sonia, what are your thoughts? Yes, um, I agree with many points and particularly with the fact that we have to think about that much more than we've done before and that probably a dialogue with sociology and the sociology of globalization is a good starting point for that because sociology does very much operate with these categories and provides some very interesting reflections on our present, which then would profit from an historical endeavor and to go deeper into these processes and ask for their variations. Because I, I mean, I'm a comparative historian or specializing in comparative history, so I'm interested in, in differences between nations and, and in the multiple variants of patterns and not would not um, make um, claims for the role of the nation in the present. I think um, that the COVID crisis actually is a very interesting case study for the relationship between globalization and the nation state and has some, some interesting consequences uh, or some interesting observations can be made. Um, for example, that within this global crisis, the fact or the question which nation state a person lives is determining its, its chances for living, its chances for health, it's, it's determining very much its chances um, of economic success or failure um, of his life. And this interestingly does correlate only to a certain degree with the richness, the wealth or poverty of nations, but it correlates very much with political decisions. And I think um, it's very much uh, shows how central political decision making is in reacting to process of, of globalization and um, that there's no automatic um, consequence of globalization on the nation, no automatic implications, but that um, politics in some way has even gained a new possibilities and nation states have gained new strengths and um, particularly or maybe some one, one point or one field which has also been researched by sociology is the globalization of knowledge which also was very very good to see in the COVID crisis and um, the global circulation of knowledge um, gives nation states new possibilities to act um, to, to base their political decisions on on a far um, larger corpus of knowledge than the nation state ever was able to do before, yes. And um, so from that globalization of knowledge, also interesting nation states all around the world profit. I mean, there are also inequalities in this uh, production of knowledge, but still um, nation states all over the world profit from new possibilities to, to yeah, to found their, their, their political decisions. And that is one aspect which we could take to argue that the nation state is stronger than it has ever been before. Thanks, Sonia. Yeah, I just, you know, listening to you, was just wondering whether we are not also facing the consequences of the excessive promises of the global turn, uh, uh, which went, I'm not say largely, but often unfulfilled. And uh, Sonia was referring to the, 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 the Histoire Mondiale de la France. Uh, uh, one could go back to the 1990s and the effort to internationalize or deprovincialize US history, Ian Tyrell, De La Pietra meetings, and so which out of a big, big ambitious program came remarkably little in terms also of historiographical you know, innovation and new interpretations and so forth and so on. Uh, I, I, we have a question which uh, has been posed in, in written form in, in the chat by, by Giacomo Mazzei. I'm gonna uh, read it aloud. Are we discovering that a world where there is only one alternative in the absence of functional global government results in the gradual weakening of globalism itself? And uh, will the rise of China, complex and problematic and alternative as it is, reignite globalist debate? If so, uh, uh, to the extent that such a geopolitical change will occur, what could be its effect on historiography? And finally, we will go back to the good old times, which weren't so good and are not so old uh, after the Cold War. 
And Jeremy, do you want to take it? Uh, there are several questions within uh, one uh, one question. Um, uh, yeah, so may, maybe I'll, I'll I'll take a couple of them, and then others can jump okay. in as well. Uh, uh, I, I think the the one the, the question about China is a really really interesting one, and in a way, uh, Sonia, you were very polite in gesturing in this direction. That in a, the response to COVID and the reassertion of the of you know we talk about vaccine nationalism, but the story about what might be called the outbreak narrative, and there's in fact a wonderful book about pandemic storytelling. Um, um, let's say excited the patriotic narr narrators uh, a lot um, in China and in the United States. It's like a quickly part of what's often called by political scientists, and I agree with, with Sonia completely, that we need a more open dialogue with our cousins in other disciplines in the human sciences, is called weaponized interdependence. And the storytelling habits can add to to this, and you saw this very clear, and we're seeing this very clearly in, in the pandemic, and we could talk some more about that. But the, what's been interesting to watch in, um, in the dialogue around China and, uh, and the United States, there was once a way in which pundits talked about something called the Thucydides trap, and we don't have to spend so much time unpacking it, but the idea that there is this organic and necessarily conflictual relationship between, um, let's say, rising powers and, and declining uh, uh, powers. I have always been very skeptical of that model of thinking about rise and fall. Um, Paul Kennedy would write this way. It's an old way of writing about empires too, uh, because it does not grapple with the nature of interdependence, which COVID is a perfect example of something that starts in Wuhan, winds up in a couple of weeks in Wisconsin uh, because we are uh, uh, interdependent. And uh, so the Thucydides trap fails to, and this is a little bit of a pushback on Sonia, I, as I was in a sense, my comparativist inclinations are, are to look for difference, but um, they are, the units are embedded into one, and this was, I think, Hannah Arendt's point, right? In, in, into a wider frame, she would have called it, she called it humanity, um, uh, and, and to see in which the, the various responses to commonness, or one might say methodologically speaking, to talk about uh, what Ken Pomerantz and others have called embedded comparisons. And that's, we can talk some more about the methodological implications of that. But the China-US story is a grappling over um, interdependence and co-managing interdependence, which was very easy for the United States to manage so long as China was viewed as the client state, the backward state, the developing state. This goes back to Federico's point around the, you know, sort of the development side. Um, but once the United China um, becomes a, a co-member of this interdependent order as a competitor, the United States is having a very hard time reframing it. I think this, there's a materialist way in which this works, but I think there's frankly a racial dimension to this as well. Um, so that's the China side of the story. Will we go back to the good old times of the Cold War? I, I don't think so, um, frankly. Um, I mean, I, I'm just a historian, not a crystal ball gazer, but I don't, and this is where I don't know if any of you watch the conversation yesterday and then in the the and the climate change um um it wasn't really a conference what was it it was a i watched it on the new york times it was a virtual watching all these grand, grandees pontificate about their objectives that none of them are going to meet um but what was interesting is that and here i do think that that climate change um is poses uh, a set of risks and is also an opportunity, this goes back to Sonia's point, for reimagining the nation as a way to tackle it. And this is clearly how Joe Biden and others are fashioning infrastructure policy and so on, which is that the nation is the engine for combating uh, climate change. 
but it does presume a, a form of interdependence that was not there when we thought about the Cold War as something that was about competing systems. And that's not what's at stake here. So I think the difficulty is, and this is, you know, we, we don't have, we, we're narratively impoverished or challenged. We, we don't have good ways of thinking about across scales um, and in forms uh, about uh, that, that take the presumption that interdependence is the premise of the narrative. Um, and that's what I think we have to spend some time you know, mucking around together and across boundaries. And there's not a one size fits all. And I agree completely with Sonia on that one, um, that there will need to be a comparative exercise on the reflection of our historiographic futures. Sonia, do you want to follow up on this? Well, I don't really know if I want to. Um, it's, so I think while well, stressing interdependence is, is the core of the thing and um, stressing interdependence and at the same time within a system of interdependence asking for differences of different implications for different nations, um, asking for the relationship between transnational processes and at the same time different reactions to these transnational processes. I think that's that's the core of what we, what we are doing and what we have to discuss more about. Um, regarding those questions, um, they, they, they are very important and good questions, but I don't have a good answer there. So um, maybe I can say that historians shouldn't talk about the future. Um, and I think that we won't go back to the Cold War as Jeremy says, so there will be some something new in that, in that scenario, which the um, the uh, person who's, who asked the question um, draws, but um, so I, th I think uh, they're good questions to think about, but I haven't got a good answer here. And Jeremy's given us a lot to think about, so I'm passing there. I would just add one more little thing in response to saying, I think we are always writing histories of the future. Um, I think what's hard to say is what is is we don't know yet what the alignments are going to look like now. But I do just to push back, Sonia. I think you are saying that the current incentive uh, system in Europe does not lend itself to thinking in let's say the ways we need to be thinking. So whether that leads to a historiographic cold war or not, I don't know. But I, I think historians need to be part of, and I take this as Sonia's one of our key points that you are making, Sonia, is that we need to be having a discussion about what we need materially and institutionally um, to have these kinds of discussions. And we've been quite passive about that. I, having served on ERC juries for years now, uh, I'm, I'm amazed at how the design of this is humanists and historians have not participated. We, not to say we should have a big argument about the ERC, but, but uh, I think Sonia's injunction is a really important one. I would stress that the ERC doesn't fund collaborative projects, it just funds individuals with a team of like two or three people. And uh, the size of funding is compared to well, the size of national programs, it's tiny so within the humanities. So compare the size of national funding in Germany, in France, or in Britain to the size of funding of the ERC for European history projects and um, you see that it can be make only a very, very, very small and contribution to changing something. And then it funds individuals and not large um, um, collaborative projects. There was an era in EU funding policy where collaborative projects had more funding opportunities, but that era unfortunately is over. Uh, I just to kind of put out there, Sonia and Mario and Federico and all of you, I, I, I think if you're interested, I, I think the synergy grant system is an opportunity to, to do this. I've been served a couple of times on their panels. Uh, I, I think the questions that you're considering here might be really interesting. And there, those grants are large multi-year. There are all kinds of design features of it that make it very hard for historians to do because they're three years long. We don't do stuff in those timelines. Uh, so anyway. Vico, you want to jump in? I wanted, to, I wanted to, to, no, just one point on this issue and, and then another question. No, the one point on this issue is that I fully agree that the academic and uh, research funding incentives are in the wrong place in this respect. I, I think Sonia is absolutely right. At the same time, it is also true, particularly in Europe, I mean, within the, the perimeter of the European Union, 
that the cultural cultural context and, and political context is, has changed so drastically that I mean, I'm trying to imagine a historian writing, you know, in 20 years time, the history of Europe in the new century, a history that has to deal with the financial crisis and then the politics that follow the financial crisis and then the pandemics. And it's simply impossible to, I mean, you can write a nationalist history in terms of its ethos, but it's almost impossible to write a national history that is separated uh, from, from its European context. You just cannot do it uh, materially. So th that will change something in spite of you know, the problems of the wrong uh, financing incentives that, that Sonia rightly pointed out. Um, uh, a, a brief comment about Mario's. I share, I share your idea that the historiography of internationalism that had its you know, ascending moment uh, constructed an almost sort of teleological contrast between cosmopolitan internationalist versus a nation that was about to be obliterated. And that was, you know, pretty uh, short lived, if not silly. At the same time, it produced an historiography of international organizations and transnational expert community and the interconnections between the nations and this expert community and these international organizations that is very valuable to understand how the nation themselves work. What puzzles me, though, now is, given that I largely share Jeremy's take on, on the issue of you know, reconfiguring and rethinking the nation in its interdependence, is what happened to the historiography of human rights, which has had this amazing boom over the last 20 years, and that can hardly live with the reconfiguration of rights that is taking place under our noses as civil, at best, if not national rights, at worst. The migrant issue is the main denier you know, that there are such things as universal human rights by the very societies that proclaim the universality of human rights. So that's a tension uh, that is going to explode sooner or later, and I cannot imagine in which ways. Jamie, do you want to, to answer this? Uh... Um, on, on first, the point that Federico made, and you're listening to somebody practice the piano <laughs> in the background. So, so much you can do to control. Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, the kinship network. Uh, but I, so the the uh, I, I think the point that Federico made that the global or the international turn that actually preceded the global uh, did yield important work uh, on uh, organizations, um, uh, historical figures, patterns of sociability that transcended the nation. I think actually really was, and that's. That is a path dependent consequence. We do have this enormous field. We have archives that people go to. Uh, and I think it has changed, for instance, the, the writing of empires almost more than it has had an effect on the writing of nations. And I think in particular, we can see this around the histories of uh, decolonization after 1945 and let's say that all the work that's now being done on the 1920s and the 1930s. So I think we're seeing the, a lot of that fruit now coming out. What happened to human rights? I, that's a really very good question. Um, I, I think my own personal take is that some issues got, uh, were suffered from, being cast the wrong way as question mal posé, that is that that it became uh, a debate around periodization. Um, and there I'm not sure Sam Moyne's work was, uh, uh, it got read in particular ways where he was trying actually, if anything to say that there, were, there was a relationship between the disenchantment with decolonization and the rise of human rights. In fact, it got turned into a debate about whether human rights started in the 1970s or whether it starts with the Universal Declaration or whether it starts with the French Revolution, which I, I think was not a very meaningful way for it to get, but it got sidetracked in that direction. 
I think it was also very limited because it was something engaged or in um, very attached to a particular liberal uh, imaginary, which isn't to say that liberal configurations of human rights aren't important or weren't important. They were actually uh, central, but it meant that other ways of thinking about rights uh, often were not seen as part of the human rights uh, literature. Um, but if we widen the prism and think about, for instance, the history of development, or think about human rights as one a story about human capacities, I, I think there is an ongoing, I'm not so pessimistic, I think there are ongoing other kinds of works that are now fueling, uh, fueling this. And I just done the last point that you made that you go I think the the global migrant crisis which is not going away I think the pandemic has had the effect of diminishing people's the visibility of the issue um, and that's why I end on the statelessness question is is the one that poses uh, and, and and the question about having rights to have rights has to be central to uh, to the storytelling. Uh, and that's not going away anytime soon. And there's an explosion of literature now in that field. So I think if we widen out from thinking about a more liberal framing of it, um, you can, I think we can start to see many more directions in which human rights are flowing. Now, the piano player at Jeremy's uh, uh, reminds us, speaking of human rights, the fundamental human rights of uh, Zoom participants uh, 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 rule that more than 90 minutes on, on Zoom is a basic violation of human rights, as my students uh, constantly uh, point out. Uh, they, they petition the, the administration for, for uh, urging professors to keep uh, their Zoom classes uh, uh, under 90 minutes. Uh, I don't know if there are other questions uh, uh, coming. I see that Giacomo has a follow-up in, in the chat. Uh, I just wanted to throw in China. And I was also thinking about the time when, given the competition between world systems, even a meeting in a tiny communist cell in Italy, as the one Giacomo attends, uh, starts with a discussion on global on global events, which is which is true. At the end of the day, well, yeah. which is why I just to, to underscore, I think and we and we haven't really talked about this, but I would say that that the challenge for historians. Uh, and a, a sort of a progressive historians who are looking for um, sort of uh, narratives that were more connected to things like social justice, um, thought of themselves as, or, or had deep tap roots in the history of internationalism, right? Uh, of which communism was certainly an important part. Thanks. So, I, um, Sonia, if you want to have the last word, if you want to comment on what was just said, and then we can call uh, the seminar to, to an end. Well, not really last word, just it was a great debate. It was a great discussion. It was great to be here. Many thanks and um, have a nice weekend. Okay. Um, so we can call it to an end. Thanks so much. I, I, I asked the other participants to give you, uh, Sonia and Jeremy, a virtual but uh, 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 loud uh, round of applause. Uh, or, or, uh, and thanks so much for accepting uh, our invitation and for being uh, the, the guest of this uh, Cisco uh, uh, seminar. And I hope the next one as we always say, will be in person and, uh, and in Italy. Thank you so much uh, to Jeremy and Sonia and to the other participants. And uh, I don't know if Federico, if you want to announce the, the fourth and last uh, session, because I actually forgot the, the date of the next. Not if I don't have it in front of me right now either, but uh, it will sure be on our website uh, within the day or at maximum within the weekend with all the information needed. It's the last one. And uh, yeah, that's it. And it's actually on the 14th of May. So Thank you. Uh, the last one, yeah. Thank you, Marco. So. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, have a great weekend. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Thank you, great. everyone. Thanks, Mario. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks, Sonia. Have a great weekend, everyone. See you. Bye. Bye.